Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to see you here, and I see a lot of faces from last time, which is encouraging. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm going to make you work a little harder tonight uh, than I did last time. And uh, it takes a lot of work to become an inventor. It doesn't come naturally. I think innovation comes to us naturally. And um, also, inventing to a certain point comes naturally. We have to do that just to get through our daily uh, routine in our lives. But uh, turning that invention, inventive uh, uh, spirit into money is something that doesn't come naturally. And if you want to be an inventor who commercializes inventions, then you have to learn about it. It's not taught uh, in schools generally. At least I don't know of any school in, where, in which it's taught. But it, it, there really are a lot of steps to it that you need to know, otherwise you likely to fail. So I'm going to try to address those tonight. Uh, this is the second lecture in a four lecture series. Um, I thank uh, Embry-Riddle University for hosting this this evening. And um, the topic tonight, as Madge said, is intellectual property. Um, and I have to make this go. Uh, some of you will recognize this map uh, on the right from last time. I'm going to go through it very, very quickly for those of you who were not here. But this is the way I see the, an overview of the route uh, leading from the upper left-hand corner, uh, number one here on the map, and eventually winding up down in this area where there are bags of money. Uh, each one represents a different exit strategy for the inventor. Uh, there are a lot of well-defined steps that need to take place along this torturous route in order to get down here to success. So I'm going to go through it very, very quickly, but up here at number one, uh, you're shuffling through a, a bunch of notes that you have on uh, problems that you think you might be able to solve. And number two, you found one that you think you can solve and it has commercial, um, some commercial possibilities. And when you've chosen that, that gets you through gate number three. Beyond gate number three, in this area of the route, you're within your mind's eye, within your own imagination, you're maturing your invention uh, as far as you possibly can. Just working it over and over and over in your mind until you're satisfied with it. Uh, once you have that once you have gone as far as you can in your mind's eye, then you arrive at gate five, and that opens gate five. Now, at this point, uh, you should stop and make some sketches in a bound journal. You should keep your notes in a bound journal as you go along. Uh, I don't want uh, to recommend doing any formal drawings or anything at this point. That's too soon. But just try to jot down what you've done so you remember it. And then along this stretch of the path, you're looking at the commercial viability of the design. Uh, can you manufacture it? Is there a market for it? Are there entry barriers that are insurmountable? And so on. Um, there is a possibility of some help along the way through local organizations, such as uh, small business development centers, and perhaps some early funding opportunities. Come in, please, come in some early funding opportunities through the Small Business Administration. Uh, and then further down the path, we come to a point here where we're entering this uh, gold circle. And this is the part of the path that I'm going to talk about this evening. Uh, our first event will be going through an area here where we're going to study the basic elements of uh, intellectual property. And once we're armed with that, we, that gets us through this gate, and then we're up here with a lot of choices to make about what to do next. Uh, you can go to a patent professional and get your patent filed, or you can uh, foolishly go down here and file it yourself. Uh, we're going to look at this route tonight, past point 11, where you have a side trip to understand how to search patents and how to do uh, a, uh, a poor man's or a layman's uh, uh, patent infringement analysis, 
And then armed with that, you can either go back to the professional, which I recommend, or you can file it yourself, and that gets you through to gate 15. Gate 15 opens when you have a patent. Uh, you go further down the route. There are people here waiting to steal your money. They're patent marketing firms uh, that you should stay away from. Here there will be another side trip later to look into different ways to commercialize your intellectual property. And then these various stages of development of your intellectual property finally get you to the pot of gold. So that's a quick overview of what we did last week for those of you who weren't here. So what is uh, intellectual property? Well, it, it comprises the unique products of your own intellect. Uh, whatever you create that is original with your mind is your own intellectual property. Now, um, there, in order to keep ownership of that, you have to protect it in certain ways, and we're going to talk about that tonight. How is it protected? Well, the, there are four elements available uh, to us in the States for protecting that. They are, depending on the sort of intellectual property, they are trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and patents. We're going to look at all of those this evening. Uh, this will be the side trip to point seven on the map where we'll learn all of that stuff. Now, uh, there are a lot of ways to lose or compromise your ownership and your intellectual property. Um, and I uh, want to just talk about these up front. First of all, if you work for somebody, you probably have some sort of an employment agreement. And your employment agreement could require that you assign the rights to your intellectual property to your employer. Now, that usually happens if the thing you're working on is something that falls into the employer's uh, realm of business. But you need to get a release on that. And so before you go spending a lot of money or spending a lot of your wheels, you should try to get uh, to clarify your relationship with your employer. Um, the other thing you might inadvertently or accidentally do to lose some of your rights is to do work on your invention in someone else's property. For instance, if, uh, if you're employed uh, in a machine shop, and you have uh, an invention that has to do with a, a mechanical machine product, if you use your employees, employers' facilities, even after hours, the employer can come back later and um, demand a certain ownership in your invention. That's called shop rights, and they are to be very carefully avoided. Uh, it's needless to, to lose your ideas like that. The other way to lose them is by inadvertently picking up a co-inventor. Uh, I'll talk later about patents, but one of the things that the patent office uh, in their tutorials on how to do patents recommends is that you keep a, a bound uh, logbook, and in that logbook you write down all your ideas, and when you have some sketches or things in there that represent uh, an advancement of your idea, you have someone sign and witness it. Well, there are two things wrong with that. One is that person might not respect your trust in, in his or her uh, uh, conf confidentiality and, and go talking about your ideas. The other thing is that that person could suggest to you an obvious improvement or extension to your idea, probably something you would eventually think of anyhow. But once he has done that, or she has done that, uh, they could claim to be your co-inventor. That's very bad because that co-inventor has every right, full rights to the entire patent. So be careful uh, of with whom you share your uh, ideas up front. Um, the other way to give up your ownership is through the loss of patentability. We'll talk more about that later in this evening's lecture. But uh, there are some rules that you must be followed, that must follow, sorry, that you must follow uh, in order to acquire a United States patent. 
Uh, for instance, you cannot have put the thing up for sale before you file the patent. If you do that, uh, I'm talk I see somebody taking a note. I'll, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, at this moment in time, you can put it up for sale within a year before the patent files, uh, before you file even a provisional. Uh, starting next month, you won't be able to do that. So you should, before you start out along the path, decide if you, in fact, really own the idea. If you think there's any compromise to it, uh, you probably should uh, put that back in, in the box and pick another one out to work on. Okay, there's a lot of stuff now to be learned tonight. And I don't think you can take enough notes to get all of this down. But these uh, lectures are going to be available on YouTube uh, probably within a month. So if you don't get everything written down uh, or you can't remember it all, you, you can go there later to see it. So the page that I have up here is, uh, will appear if you go on the internet and go to this www.uspto.gov. That is the official United States Patent and Trademarks uh, Office. And be careful because there's one called dot, uh, .com, which someone has taken over. That's a commercial, uh, commercial site that you probably is, is not what you're looking for. Once you go to that site, though, that site is marvelous. And uh, the US government is trying so hard now, in many ways, to uh, nurture independent inventors. And so there's a lot of stuff on this site, and I'm going to refer to this uh, over and over again this evening. When you go to that site, there's an icon, which I've shown here, that you click on. And uh, it opens up this page, uh, all this stuff that's on the right-hand side. And I'll be looking at several of these items as we go along this evening. But I will tell you that a lot of the worth in this evening's lecture is not in the words that I have to share with you, but in these sites. Uh, and so this is the most valuable thing that I'm sharing with you tonight as we go through the talk. Okay. Um, I've just put a little image of the map up here to remind you where we are. But we're down here now in this area of, of uh, studying intellectual property. And some of you might wonder why I didn't start up here with the first detailed lecture. Uh, I was wondering about that myself. Uh, but it turns out that in lecturing on this subject, even though this is the way you would go when you're actually doing this, um, so many questions come up about intellectual property early in the game that I wanted to try to get those out of the way this evening. So this is tonight's lecture will be in this area. Uh, next week's lecture will be on the upper part of the map and the last week's lecture will be on pretty much on commercial aspects of, of invention. So. You, uh, again, uh, to, on this map, you go to the site that I gave you before and click on the independent inventors symbol, which you saw. If you select the patent for inventors icon, uh, shown up here, it opens up a, a, a great simple explanation of patents for the layman to understand. It's not written for attorneys. It's written for people like you and me. And uh, you can go in there, and if you study it, you'll learn a ton of useful information about uh, patents. Now, I can't possibly cover all of this in a, in a lecture or two, but uh, if you go to these sites and you're willing to study, you're going you're gonna to learn a lot. So if, after you have gone to Patents for Inventors and studied that, then go back to the Independent Inventors icon that you started with, and select the, another icon called Pro Se and Pro Bono. Uh, these are two um, other uh, short, pretty short paragraphs that uh, give you more information. But the good thing about this is if you go into the Pro Bono section, uh, you can click on a, 
a training video to watch. And that video uh, leads you through all of the steps that it takes in a couple different ways and a sequence for patenting. And at the end of that, um, you, at the end of the training video, you can take a test, an online test, and you will get a certificate, uh, uh, the use for which I do not know, but <laughs> it will indicate that you have uh, passed that course. And I, I just highly recommend that you go through these things. Now, um, the next one down, you, again, you go back to the inventors, uh, independent inventors icon, and then click on this uh, education and information icon. And you will find a training, another training video there called From Concept to Protection. Go and see that. Um, that'll, at least, you know, like one hour uh, slide presentations by the Patent and Trademark Office. So that's as up to date and accurate information as you're going to get. Um, when I say up to date, now I want to again say that the patent laws are, are due to make significant changes on the 16th of March. So if you visit them now, you might want to go back and visit after the 16th of March and see what they say. Um, I'll talk about the changes a little bit later in the talk. Yeah, if you do what, what I've outlined in this slide, you will have everything as an independent, and if you learn it, you'll have everything you need as an independent inventor um, to all the information you need to protect and understand your intellectual property. Oh, I'm going to go back one slide now just for a minute. And um, there, you'll see some other icons on here. And I just want to reiterate that to get to these things, you start with this icon on the site. And then you're going to look at this one first. Uh, then you're going to look at this one next. And you're going to look at this one next. And we'll talk about a couple of the other ones of these as we go along. OK, well, I, I mentioned that there were four things that uh, ways to protect your intellectual property. Uh, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and patents. And I'm going to start with uh, trademarks. Uh, a trademark, uh, and finish with patents, because that's the one I'm going to spend my time on. But a trademark is just something that you use, a, a symbol, uh, a, a few words linked together, something that identifies your product or service that, that, uh, that will uh, distinguish it from those of your competitors. Actually, there's a thing called a service mark, which is used for services. But in uh, normal uh, uh, conversation, everybody talks about both of them as trademarks. No, it gives, uh, it's valuable, obviously, because it gives immediate recognition for your uh, product. Uh, Nike's swoosh label uh, logo is one with just the, the hooked uh, symbol. Or McDonald's golden arches, for example. As soon as you see those golden arches, you know what you're in for. Uh, so <laughs> they, they are immediate, uh, immediately tell you a lot. Now, uh, you can uh, register such a trademark. And you can uh, do that through the uh, US Patent and Trademark Office. But you don't have to register it. You can simply acquire a common law ownership of it through use. And that's one of the things that make trademarks so difficult to research or pin down, because uh, you go out and, and gin up some sort of a trademark and use it on your product and don't tell anybody. Um, and somebody else comes up with something very similar and wants to register it, probably they can. And then you have some sort of a conflict. So you should try to avoid that. Um, the other thing is that some trademarks can be copyrighted. I think with the Nike's logo, I, I'm not sure, but I think there's a few words like just do it or something like that. So that conveys a message, a, a written message, and, and that can be copyrighted uh, as well. 
So if you have a common law ownership, you can use this little TM symbol that you've often seen beside trademarks. Or if you register it with the uh, Patent and Trademark Office, you can lose a, use the little R in a circle to mark your products. And this, this puts people on notice that you have uh, really established your rights to that mark. And uh, if they use it, they're going to possibly be in trouble. So uh, again, I'm not going to talk very much about this this evening, but um, I'm going to once again point you to uh, another site. You go back to the USPTO.gov, uh, back to the Independent Inventors uh, logo, and then click on Trademarks for Inventors. And uh, here again, you have a lot of uh, summary information and instructional videos. Once again, you have to do some work but they go there and study those and learn as much about them as you can. Uh, the next is copyrights. I'm going to say even less about these. A copyright really grants you the right to copy something, just like the name says. And uh, it protects authorship of things like uh, music, literature, movies, uh, dance moves, architecture, paintings, all that sort of things which express an idea, but do not, it does not say how to do something or, or, or whatever. So once again, I'm going to take you back to go to a, a website. This is a different one. This is www.copyright.gov. And that's because copyrights are not administered through the Patent and Trademark Office. They are administered through the Library of Congress. Uh, makes kind of sense because it uh, originally had to do with uh, copying uh, printed material. Anyhow, there's once again a very good tutorial there called Taking the Mystery Out of Copyright. And it looks like, um, like, a, like a child's cartoon with animated characters. But it gets right to the point and tells you everything that you, as an independent inventor, need to know to understand about the basics of copyrights. Um, I have a lot of stuff to go through tonight, and so I'm, I'm, I have to go through these kind of fast. Um, trade secrets, uh, we discussed a little bit last time. There's not too much more to say about them. Uh, they protect uh, mostly ways of doing things, methods of, of doing things. Uh, they do not require any filing with any agency. They never expire. There are no maintenance fees required. They do require constant vigilance, though, because if you do not protect your trade secrets and maintain those secrets, once they get away from you in any legal way, they're not yours anymore and they must be used to gain some sort of a business advantage. Uh, I have an example of when you might want to use a trade secret rather than a patent. And the example would be, suppose that a manufacturer of, of tubing finds a way to make a very high quality seamless tubing, metal tubing, in whatever lengths you want. So nobody else knows how to do that. Now, if he keeps that, or she keeps that um, secret, nobody else can apply that method to make tubing, unless they discover it on their own. If he were to have patented that, then in patenting, he would have had to describe the method. And once the method is described, anybody knows how it's done. They still couldn't do it for the 20-year lifetime of the patent. But once that expires, anybody can do it. So he is best to keep that close to the chest, not tell anybody about it, and maintain that position as long as he can. So here's where we'll spend most of the time this evening. And I wanted you to just read this. I'll read it with you to tell you exactly what a patent is. It's a property right granted by the government to an inventor to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling the invention throughout the United States, or importing the invention into the United States for a limited time, which is the lifetime of the patent, uh, in exchange for a public disclosure 
of the invention, which means the tubing manufacturer would have had to disclose it. Um, now, what it does not do is grant you the right to make or sell that yourself. Well, I suppose you could make it, but you couldn't necessarily sell it. Suppose you invented something that was illegal. You couldn't sell it. Or suppose uh, you've seen a wrench that someone else has invented, and uh, you invent a T-handle to give that a little more torque or something as part of the assembly. You could patent and, and own the rights to that T-handle, but you couldn't make it with that wrench because you don't own the wrench's uh, patent. So there, it, it grants you the right to exclude, but it doesn't grant you the right to break any laws or usurp someone else's patent rights. There are three types of patents. There are design patents, plant patents, and utility patents. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about utility patents, but we'll look briefly now at each of these types. A design patent is granted for a manufactured article's new, original, or ornamental design. It's the aspect of something. Um, it, um, they cover how manufactured articles look, but they do not cover how they function. That is a utility patent, which we'll talk about later. Uh, they have a 14-year lifetime from the effective filing date. Only one claim is permitted. There are no maintenance fees. As I mentioned, uh, no, I didn't mention, for copyrights, uh, there's some overlap with design patents. Um, for instance, if you did design this, just do it, a uh, fancy set of words to go as a trademark, uh, you could mark that trademark that. Or if that was on a cup or something that you were using, or a shoebox, you could get a design patent for that exterior aspect of the shoebox. Um, so it overlaps both with trademarks and copyrights. It can get very confusing also because trademarks and copyrights are acquired by common law use and do not need to be registered, as I mentioned. So, um, An example of a, of a utility patent and a design patent, the differences between them would be a mouse trap. Suppose that you invented uh, a design for a mouse trap that, that made it look like a piece of Swiss cheese, but it trapped mice in the same old way. You could get a design patent for your mouse trap, but not a utility patent. But now if it also trapped mice differently, you could get both a design patent and a utility patent. That's all I'm going to say about those this evening. And plant patents, I will say practically nothing about. They're granted for distinct, uh, asexually reduced, produced varieties of plants. Uh, they permit only one claim. They have a duration of 20 years. And in many other respects, are the same as utility patents. So here are the big ones, utility patents. These are the ones that we generally think of when we think of patents. They are, in order to be eligible, the patented thing must perform some function, must do something. It must be novel, meaning that it cannot have been previously patented or described in a printed publication or in public use or on sale or otherwise available to the public. These conditions that I've just outlined are the ones taking effect on the 16th of March. Right now, if you get it patented today, you could, in fact, print it in a publication, have it in public use, or have it up for sale. So these changes are made to bring the United States into line with the other industrialized countries of the world. We have, we've had our own unique set of patent laws for many years. But now, with so much uh, global, globalization of the economy, it, there's a method, I mean, maybe a move afoot now to equalize these rules. So um, the patent must also be non-obvious. So it can't be something that is, is clearly there for anybody to see. And so these are the only three criteria, plus 
in order to acquire the patent, you must present the patent application, uh, which completely describes the patent and, um, and, and, um, and how it's used, how it's made. You, you must describe it as comprehensively as possible in the application. So uh, there's uh, th something now to say. About two-thirds of the applications received in the government patent office uh, are granted a patent. That's got to tell you something. It doesn't take much to get a patent. Uh, most patents are worthless, but you can get one. So uh, people who set out to try simply to obtain a patent on something are nuts. Uh, you get one, it costs you a lot of money, it won't be any good for anything. If that's your goal, <laughs> if that's your only goal. So even though so many patent applications, patent applications are accepted, patents are granted, very few patented inventions ever make it to the marketplace, very few. And of those, vanishingly few ever make a dollar for the inventor. So this is why it's so extremely important that you do things correctly while you're going about this business of inventing. These two things were granted utility patents. That means that they have performed some function and uh, were deemed to be worthy of a patent by the Patent and Trademark Office. The one on the right here is a plexiglass helmet with little platforms in it uh, on which you could plant some cactus. And they're made for joggers to increase the oxygen in the air that the jogger is breathing. Um, they got a patent on that, but can you imagine? <laughs> I, I can't. Now, this one is a little more clever. It's a cat feeder. And um, on the top of this pole is a what looks like a bird feeder. And the birds fly in, and when they land on this little platform, it folds down, and they drop down into this chute, uh, into a cage, which a cat's paw can get into, but a bird can't get out of. And so it's guaranteed by its inventor to feed not only your cat when you're on vacation, but all the cats in the neighborhood. Um, anyhow. Doesn't take much. Okay, there are three ways, to, uh, or, sorry, several ways to apply for patents. And the first one is to file, I know there's a lot of interest in this, to file a provisional patent application. Uh, they are available for plant patents and utility patents, not for design patents. A provisional application can be filed without claims, it can be filed with informal drawings, but it must have a complete written description of the invention. Now, I've, in other lectures, people have told me that they have been advised to be as vague as possible in their provisional patent applications. Uh, that is absolutely not the case. You will only get the benefit of the provisional application according, only get the benefit of what's included in it. So if you don't include, include anything, you're not going to get the benefit of that. Uh, these are, are low-cost, um, uh, provisional ones are a low-cost alternative to a traditional, what is now called a non-provisional patent application. Uh, it's something to get your, your stake in the sand with the patent office to get an effective filing date for your invention. So, You've got to have it well described, have adequate drawings. You, once you have that filed, even though it is not examined by the Patent and Trademark Office, you can put patent pending on your product and you can talk to people about it. I would say you still should be very circumspect in what you say because you don't know exactly what you own yet. But you have a, at least a bit of a cover of protection. Now, a provisional patent application, by the way, there's no such thing as a provisional patent. This is a provisional application for a patent. Um, once you file it, 
you get an effective filing date, which is the date on which it's filed with the Patent and Trademark Office. And from that date forward, you're covered for 12 months. Within the 12 month period, you have the opportunity to file a non-traditional, uh, sorry, a non-provisional patent application or to convert the provisional to a non-provisional. You must do that within that 12 month window in order to get the effective filing date of the provisional application. If you get to the end of that 12 months and you're still not ready to do anything, uh, the patent office hasn't opened that yet. They're going to throw it in the trash. File another provisional application and get another 12 months and so on. You lose the effective filing date of the first one, but at least you can move your program forward without having yet invested a lot of money. Now, um, I'm going to skip down one item here to say that once a patent has been on file for 18 months, the application is published. So the effective filing date will be the date that you file the provisional application, or if you never file a provisional, it will be the date on which you file the non-provisional application. Now, another thing you can do is somewhere within that 12 months, convert your provisional application to a non-provisional one. I really don't recommend that at all, but for, because it, it shortens the lifetime of the patent, the effective lifetime of the patent, by whatever those months are. And um, if uh, you're not, if your provisional is not really up to snuff, you haven't perfected the application yet, it's better to file another one. But provisional ones are great, and I recommend that as soon as you have your idea firmly in mind, you should file one. Uh, it costs about $200 if you do it yourself. It can cost several hundred to a thousand dollars if a professional does it for you. But um, it's a good investment. Um, so, um, the non-provisional is what we think about as a, as a traditional patent application. There are a lot of rules that these have to follow. They must be filed with the title, abstract, formal drawings, claims, everything else associated with it. And it must describe the very best mode in which the inventor contemplates that it will be used. So you, you really have to express exactly how it's made and how it's used. You now, as I've said before, you, at this point in time, it must not have been sold, offered for sale, or publicly advertised for sale prior to the effective filing date. And the application publishes 18 months after the effective filing date. The 20 year lifetime of the patent commences with the filing of the non provisional or the conversion of the provisional to a non provisional. I know this is probably dull as stumped for all you to hear, but this is all stuff that you need to know. Um, I, I don't find it very exciting to tell it to you, but this is it. <laughs> so, um, for a non-provisional patent application, the costs range upward from $8,000, uh, depending on the complexity of the patent. Uh, my recent ones, I didn't think have been too complex, have cost me around $15,000 to get filed. Um, I don't like that, <laughs> and none of you will. Uh, and it is one of the things that is, a, I think, a bottleneck in our system that deters a lot of people from going forward with their ideas. But as yet, I don't know any way around that. There is no way, I don't think. Well, I'm going to talk about one other kind of patent application now. These last two are applications that would be filed in the United States. Uh, this next one is called a PCT application. Uh, PCT stands for Patent Cooperation Treaty. There are um, 140 countries in the world that subscribe to the Patent Cooperation Treaty. That's all the industrialized countries in the world. So you have, um, after the effective filing date of your U.S. patent, you have another year to file 
a window in which to file a PCT application. So if you contemplate that your invention will be used outside of the United States, I highly recommend that your next step within the 12 months following your, uh, your effective filing date be to file a PCT application. They are not very expensive to file, uh, but what it does is allow 30 months then from your U.S. patent's effective filing date uh, uh, to file in foreign countries. So it leaves that window open for another 30 months for you to file in foreign countries. But you might say, uh, why not uh, file immediately in foreign countries? Very good reason for that. Uh, if you file in a foreign country, a single foreign country, it has to be filed in the language of that company, country, whereas the PCT is filed in the language of the country in where the original patent was filed, in our case being the United States, and language would be English. Um, it pays one, you pay one set of fees, modest fees, to file in 140 different countries. That's the best bargain in all of this that I have seen. Um, it temporarily avoids translation fees, because if you're going to file in a foreign country, you have to file the patent in the language of that country. That's very expensive. And it needs to be filed in the format and examined according to the rules of that foreign country. In my past experience, filing a foreign patent in a foreign country cost about $60,000. So it's not something you do lightly at all. But the PCT gives you 30 months to decide if you want to do that, and if you do want to do it, in which countries you wish to file. You can decide that. Okay, I'm moving on now. That's the end of, of my leading you to information where you can learn about patents um, and trademarks copyrights and trade secrets. I'm moving down now on the map to this learning opportunity here uh, at map point 11. And this, I think, is one of the most, not that it's all important, but this, as an inventor, is one of the most useful things that I can tell you. And it's uh, how to search patents easily online. So I'm just say, suppose you've just come up with a, an idea for a caller to walk your pet snake. Um, you would go to uh, www.google.com slash patents. This is a, a wonderful site. Uh, Google has a, uh, has a cooperative uh, arrangement with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to put all U.S. patents since 1790, when the patent office was originated, online and available. So with a click or two of a mouse, you can get to any of those patents. So if you wanted to look on your snake caller, you would put some descriptive information or a patent number into the search window that comes up when you go to the Google site. In this case, I put in snake caller and two patents U.S. patents, excuse me, exist for snake callers. This is the first one that comes up. Um, again, I wouldn't uh, hope that the fellow put too much of his savings into that. But <laughs> uh, nevertheless, that's what it is. So this now, I'm going to lead you through this a little bit, but this is something you really need to learn how to do. Why should you do it? Well, it's really instructional. If you uh, have, um, I'll say some of the people have explained their, their uh, inventions to me here this evening, but suppose you have a, an idea for a desalinization plant. Okay, you can go into google.com slash patents and put in uh, desalinization, and you'll come up with a ton of patents. And you go through those and pick out ones that look like they might be similar to your idea. Now, um, what this does is increase your familiarity with, with the body of what's called art that's out there in your field. So that's really important for you to know. 
Um, it might, uh, and if you don't turn up some art that's close to what you're patenting, you're not doing a good search. So you will find it. It's almost unheard of, or maybe absolutely unheard of, to come up with an idea that is completely new. So it also often reveals unanticipated uses for your own invention. You know, suppose your desalinization plant is for, uh, to be put offshore of San Diego, and it's a monstrous thing. Um, and you see another one where someone has tried to have one for use aboard ship, and maybe it doesn't work so well, and yours would. So you get an unexpected and unanticipated possible use for your invention. It also tells you what your competitors are doing. And um, if, um, if you have uh, some things out there that look close to what you're inventing, but they've been patented for some time and you don't see them on the market, I've often called the inventors of, you know, you get a name on a patent, look up the name and call, call a person. Say, what's happening with your patent? Well, well you know, uh, I just couldn't get it on the market for this or that reason. That's valuable knowledge to you. So don't, be, don't be shy about calling inventors. And inventors always are willing to blab about their inventions. They even talk too much about them. I know I, I do. Um, you can also see things that might improve your invention. Maybe uh, some additional feature of what you're working on that you hadn't contemplated that would make it useful in different marketplaces. So um, yeah, that is also good. And then, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it will aid you to prepare your own patent application. And it costs nothing, and it's fun. Go online and, and do it. I mean, even if you're not thinking of inventing something, just put in some nutty idea in here, and you'll get an hour's entertainment out of it. OK. So once you have found some patents that are close to yours, uh, you need to see if that patent or patents are really going to interfere with your getting patent and ownership of your own uh, patents. So that's called an infringement analysis. You want to see if your invention might infringe on someone else's. So what I've done is to just kind of uh, uh, put together a, a funny looking bottle cap opener. It has a rigid handle, it has a buckle here, it has a strap that goes back through, and what you can't really see here very well on this slide, it has some gears here that meet with molded gears on the rubber strap. So the idea is you put, the, put this, your bottle cap in here, you pull the strap, you turn the thing, and it unscrews the bottle cap. So this is just a fake, a fake invention that I put together for a demonstration. But now you go online and you search uh, for, uh, for bottle cap and opening devices, and here's one that comes up that looks kind of like yours. Uh, it has a handle. It has a strap. Uh, in this case, it has some metal teeth that come in to, uh, to bite into the bottle cap. And it's springy, so it, it, it tends to spring closed around the bottle cap. So you want to see if this is going to infringe, if your invention is going to infringe on this one. So I've, this particular invention has three claims. It has a first claim, uh, which is this paragraph or this long sentence here. It has a second claim that depends on the first claim. And it has a third claim that depends on the second claim. So patent claims are categorized as independent or dependent. An independent claim stands alone. Other claims go back and depend upon it. So you set up a table like this for yourself. And, and what I've done is parse his first claim into the various elements that make it up. One, it says, a tool for attaching and removing twist caps from containers. Your opener does that. Comprising a handle, yes, yours has that. A cap gripping means attached to one end of the handle. Yes, yours has that too. 
Said cap gripping means further comprising a generally circular shaped band formed of relatively thin spring-like material. No, yours is not spring-like. It's not shaped to be circular. You, you bend it around yourself. And the, his help in here relies on the shape and springiness to operate. Yours does not. Back to Halpin's claim, one end of which is attached to said handle with the opposite end thereof being unattached. Yes, yours is like that. The surface of said band, said band, which is in contact with said cap, being provided with gripping means. Nope, yours doesn't have that. With the unattached end bent inwardly to provide additional gripping means. No, yours doesn't have that. So while these two look very similar, if you parse it and look at it like this, you see that yours does not infringe on his first claim. Now, the reason that he's got so much qualifying uh, information is here is that he couldn't have gotten a patent simply for a tool for attaching and removing twist caps from containers. Those are common as dirt. So he had everything he's put in here identifies his particular invention. But unless you have every one of these things embodied in yours, you do not infringe. So as you search patents and, and try to gauge your patent against these other patents, make up a little table like this for yourself. So I, I conclude here that there's no infringement. Now, at this point, uh, you've done your patent search, you've done your infringement analysis. If you have matured your invention as much as you can, educated yourself on intellectual property basics, and done a do-it-yourself patent search, you're ready to work with a patent professional. How do you find one? Okay. Well, uh, you go back again to the old USPTO site, Independent Inventor section, and click on the state's resources icon, which is shown here. There you'll find a listing of USPTO registered patent attorneys and agents in your local area. Um, they'll, they'll have their names, addresses, phone numbers, and call some of them uh, and go interview them and then pick one to work with. Now, as I said last time, I prefer working with an agent because their hourly rate will be probably two-thirds of what the patent attorney's rate would be. But find one that works closely with a good intellectual property attorney because in the end, you're going to need them both. But I've had better luck with the agents writing the patents um, and with the attorneys keeping us all straight on the claims and, of course, being able to represent you in court. So once you've found your professional, and don't, as I mentioned last time, don't do this lightly because you're likely to be entering into a long-term close relationship with that patent professional. Um, find one you like, one you think you can work with, one you'll enjoy working with. And um, just again, I said last time, but I, some of you weren't here, the difference between attorneys and agents is that it agents can do all of the steps necessary to uh, prepare and file patents and represent you before the patent and trademark office. But they cannot represent you in a court of law and they cannot or should not advise you on contractual matters. So the at attorneys, on the other hand, can do it all. So once you find your attorney, you're going to, or your agent, you are wanting to, you want to work very closely with them. How do you do that? Well, you have to hold up your part of the team. And to do that, you have to, having done your uh, do-it-yourself patent search, uh, look at some of the recent patents that are uh, something like the one that you want to file and study the format of those. Study how they're how they're laid out and what they say about their product. And then do your very best to write a draft of your own provisional application based on that format. So what you're really trying to do is your best to actually write your patent application. Now, there's, I think there's a lot of benefit to that because you as the inventor know better than anyone else how to stress the uh, portions of your technology 
that you think are the most important and how they should be used. So the patent attorney cannot do that without your help. Um, probably cannot do that without your help. And, um, you know, that's not the attorney or agent's job. It's your job to tell them what it is. So I imagine the, a the attorneys or agents who filed the patent for the, the plexiglass hat with the cactus in it was probably gritting his teeth as he did that. But it's not his job to perfect your technology, nor is it the Patent and Trademarks Office's job to judge whether it's any good or not. They just judge whether it meets the three criteria. So in your writing that draft application, do your very best to explain, describe your invention as clearly and comprehensively as you can, and use drawings that can be informal drawings, but use whatever drawings uh, that you feel are necessary to completely understand it. And different views and things, whatever it takes, do your best, even if you're no good at it, it'll be a starting point. Then go to your patent professional with that draft, and that's where you start working. Now, um, I recommend highly that once you do start working with him, you have the patent professional do a professional search on your patent. You've done your DIY search, you've learned a lot, and you've learned how to get your draft patent written. But one of the aspects of the new laws that take effect next month is a, um, well, there are two aspects to. One is that it's now first to file the patent, who's the, who gets the rights to it not the first to invent, necessarily. So it's the first one that gets to the patent office. But because of that, the patent office has put in a review period. So nine months after the issuance of your patent, there anybody, a third party, can come up and challenge that for review, saying that you have derived that from his work. So it, that's in there to protect the inventor. Uh, suppose you invent something and somebody else hears about it and they go off and file a patent. Well, if you have some information that you have uh, actually invented that, you can challenge that and claim that it was derived from your work. So it's a two-edged sword. Uh, the other edge of the sword is that you, as an independent inventor, put your patent up and, and a big company uh, finds out about your patent, and it has very deep pockets, and it can file reviews, and then there are other things after that that they can do that will keep you tied up for a long period of time. So it, it, it cuts both ways. Um, it's these uh, review periods and the other, other opportunities to challenge your patent that are new are as yet untried. And he, just last week there was where clarifications come out, and I'm sure they're going to be more uh, very quickly, but your patent professional will know about them. So next thing you do is ask your patent professional to file your patent, and then you're on your way. So um, I end each lecture with this. <laughs> If you don't do anything with your ideas, you deserve this uh, machine to kick yourself in the butt. <laughs> so anyhow, that's uh, the end of my lecture for this evening. Thank you.